Ladies and gentlemen, words alone cannot even justify or even describe the incredible service that our next speaker has given to our nation. General Barry McCaffrey served in the United States Army for 32 years and at the time of his retirement was the youngest and most highly decorated four-star general in the history of the United States. General McCaffrey was seriously wounded in action during his four combat tours and was awarded three Purple Hearts. He was twice awarded our nation's second highest decoration for valor, the Distinguished Service Cross, and was awarded the Silver Star twice for his exceptional valor in Vietnam as a company commander in combat. He is a distinguished graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point, and during his extraordinary career in the U.S. Army, held numerous commands at home and abroad. Most notably, he commanded 26,000 soldiers of the 24th Infantry Division Combat Team during Desert Storm, where General McCaffrey led, led the 400-kilometer left hook attack in Iraq, for which he was awarded the Distinguished Service Medal. After Desert Storm, he served on the Joint Chiefs of Staff as a Special Assistant to General Colin Powell. After leaving the ranks of the United States Army, laying down his rifle and, and hanging up the uniform, his service to our nation was not over. General Barry McCaffrey then served in President Clinton's cabinet as Director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy from 1996 to 2001. At this position, he initiated a new and very visible emphasis on drug demand efforts such as prevention, treatment, and of course, drug courts, all of which have remained central to the national drug control strategy to this day. Make no mistake, although General McCaffrey is not commanding a platoon, a company, a battalion, or an entire army division, he is now fighting for our veterans with the same tenacity and aggressiveness as he did as a combat leader. His support of veterans treatment courts is an example of his unwavering commitment of ensuring that no veteran is left behind. General McCaffrey is a tireless public servant whose mark on our nation will be felt by Americans for generations to come. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand and welcome an American hero, General Barry McCaffrey. Please be seated. Yeah, well, Matt, thanks very much for that generous introduction. And uh, more importantly, Nick, for your words. They were right on target. How about a round of applause? Yeah. You know, following uh, two distinguished Marine Corps veterans, both combat veterans from the latest war, I'm always reminded, uh, I wanted to go, Nick, in the Marine Corps. My boxing coach at West Point was an all-Marine Corps boxer. Uh, a couple years ahead of me in the academy. Later on, killed in action in Vietnam, Medal of Honor recipient, unbelievable guy. So we all hero worshiped him and wanted to go in Marine Corps. My wife, when I got engaged just prior to graduation, said, no, 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 you're going in the Army. I want to see more of you than, uh, than a float. So uh, I, I was a drug policy director, went down to give a talk at Quantico to a bunch of young Marine majors. And I sort of started my talk with that, how much I'd want to be a Marine. At the end of my talk, the commandant gets up and he says, you know, General, he said, we're really thrilled to hear that. If you'd been a Marine, today you'd be a retired major. <laughs> anyway, uh, look, it's, it's an honor to be here. Looking at this group is unbelievable. I think the first uh, drug court conference I went to was probably 1996. Uh, Claire McCaskill, a few, we could have held it in a telephone booth, for God's sakes. Uh, when I started working on this issue in 96, I think there were a dozen. I went down and was a student in Miami, Florida, uh, to learn about drug courts. And I just overwhelmed. I said, this is the, the congruence of the criminal justice system, social justice, sensible public policy, and bringing treatment to bear on the chronically addicted. What a tremendous uh, concept. Now, here we are with almost 4,000 delegates. Uh, Chairman uh, Chief Justice Ray Price, outgoing. 
uh, Judge Robert Rancourt incoming, lots of people that have helped shape this over the years. Jim Ramstad, one of my heroes out of Congress, uh, Asa Hutchinson, I think Denise O'Donnell uh, out of the Department of Justice is here, a, l a large Mexican de delegation, thank God. Mexico is our partner. Canada and Mexico are the two most important countries on the face of the earth to us. They're in a tremendous struggle for justice and survival. Uh, with some high integrity, courageous leadership. A round of applause for our Mexican delegation. Uh, thanks to all the celebrities that are here, Martin Sheen, Harry Lennox, Matt per Perry, and others. Uh, you bring attention to our issue. Uh, you allow the expert to get in the spotlight. Uh, thanks to your commitment and to all of you for your involvement over the years. Um, a couple of the speakers are real heroes of mine. Lori Robinson, now over at Department of Justice again, uh, and Tim Condon, uh, and CSAT Director uh, Wesley Clark, Dr. Wesley Clark. Uh, they've done a tremendous job over the years. And then finally, look, uh, at the end of the day, good leadership counts. And uh, when Wes Tuttleson took this job as CEO, we had under a couple of thousand. Now we're at 2,600 will soon be at 3,000. Wes, thanks for your leadership. Um, let me make some uh, sort of brief remarks about the uh, Veterans Drug Courts. And by the way, let's put it in context. The 300 million of us, 307 million of us Americans, most of us are not abusing alcohol or illegal drugs. Uh, when you look at the population it is, uh, it's shocking. It's just probably hovering just under 7%. It turns out that that 7%, poly drug abuse, alcohol almost always involved, causes uh, 24 million of us to require treatment for some kind of addiction. And if you want to understand who we are and where we are, just go ask a police officer, a judge, a social worker, a hospital emergency room doc or nurse. They know all about us. We're in there all the time. You go into a prison system in the country, 2.1 million of us behind bars. And invariably, you know, pick a study you believe, it'll turn out probably 80% of us behind bars are there. That's not the charge sheet. The charge sheet said breaking and entering. It said male street prostitution. But when you look at our background, the substance abuse is what drove the whole thing. And, you know, by the way, we finally hit, we ended up with no friends. The only one left is normally your mother. She's the last one to give up on you. 2.1 million people. So our job in the largest sense, uh, number one is drug education and prevention. If you're not talking to sixth graders through 12th graders, there's a mistake here. And that means pediatricians and moms and dads and high school football coaches and, uh, and others. But then finally, we've got to get organized on treatment. You know, we, I've just been in big conferences in San Antonio, and I just came from uh, San Diego trying to help organize that treatment community. There's a gigantic gap of the availability of science-based effective treatment. And we know it works. We know that Basically, we can do better with chronic addiction than we can with currently available therapies uh, for cancer. Now, let me turn to another problem we're facing. You know, my son just deployed in his third combat tour uh, last Friday. Um, we're looking at a, uh, you know, at the height of the Iraq uh, conflict, we were running probably 180,000 troops in country. Right now, we've got 100,000 in combat. We haven't done anything like this since World War II. I was talking to a group uh, at the Army War College yesterday, primarily reserve uh, National Guard officers from all over the country. That's the reserve component and ask them to raise their hand if they had a combat tour. Every hand in the room went up. Uh, there were a significant number of them that were on their fourth combat tour. And by the way, there's actually a fight going on out there. We've had 51,000 killed and wounded. So if you were in a Marine infantry battalion fighting in the second uh, takedown of Fallujah, uh, we took 1,100 casualties in four days. There's a fight going on out there. And by the way, some of it is intensely personal. 
You know, gunfights are sort of exciting and dangerous, and, but our troops nowadays in Iraq, at the height of that war, we were running 3,000 IEDs, improvised explosive devices, per month. So a lot of these uh, combat troops, military police, logistics, you name it, on the, when they're out in a road network or running patrols, they are constantly subject to being shredded like meat on any given second. Uh, never mind the uh, rather constant. You know, if you're my son's brigade in his last combat tour, a parachute infantry brigade out in eastern Afghanistan, essentially a lot of these platoon sized units uh, are under daily combat action. There's a war going on. We shouldn't forget it. And by the way, when we look at these, uh, you know, look at the larger group of veterans, uh, 23 million of us, almost 8 million out of the Vietnam era. Uh, and by the way, they've got families that love them and care for them and are concerned about them. You end up with 20% of the country is either directly involved with a veteran uh, or part of their support structure. It's a huge challenge. I'd also remind all of us, I love to say this when I'm on the college lecture circuit, when you, when you get the Gallup polls in, in the country for the last 10 years at least, the latest one I, ju I just put up on my briefing slides, the most respected institution in this country is the U.S. Armed Forces, bar none. And I'll just, I'll just tell you, a lot of that, that has nothing to do with how cute the admirals and generals are. It has to do with our boys and girls when they volunteer to serve in the armed forces, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, uh, when they join up and, and, and agree to fight for us, uh, they write their moms and dads and say, this is an institution of courage and integrity and they care about me and they're trying to protect the country. So there are, uh, and by the way, just on sheer quality, we're recruiting the males out of the top 25% of this country. That's who's eligible in lists, and the women are out of the top 10% of this country. So when we look at the kids we got in uniform that come in at age 18 through uh, 25, let's say, uh, they're a select lot. Uh, they have a lot going for them. Then we subject them to some ferocious levels of combat. Um, you know, I used to tell people um, we were probably the most drug-free institution in American society, and that's still mostly the case. We're mostly testing drug positive at around 2%. That includes the reserve components. Uh, we're mostly uh, controlling alcohol use. Uh, but in almost every case, when you look internally, suicide rates are going up, uh, drug abuse, alcohol abuse is going up. They're under strain. The force is under strain. Uh, and primarily driven by uh, combat action. Uh, we get these um, uh, young men and women back from com combat. Lots of them are encountering problems. Uh, one of the numbers that Secretary Rick Shinseki, uh, by the way, thank God for the Veterans Administration, uh, without which we'd be in trouble. Um, but we've got, uh, we've got probably a third of the adult homeless population are veterans, 107,000 living on the streets incredible situation. Uh, Rick Shinseki's personally committed himself to having all of them off the streets before he leaves office, and we need to stand behind him on that pledge. Uh, we've got uh, probably more than 1.8 million veterans have a substance abuse disorder clinically diagnosed. Uh, maybe one in five has some symptom of mental disorder or cognitive impairment, a lot of it driven again by combat. Uh, what's combat like? It's, it's incredible. Uh, now, uh, you know, you look at the, at the force deployed in Afghanistan and Iraq, many of them uh, were taking care of them. I mean, we get two weeks R&R &R home. Uh, they can get in contact with their uh, parents over telephone and, and uh, Internet. Uh, they got terrific medical care, include mental health. Uh, we're really taking care of these kids. Their food and their nutrition. When you see them on TV, they don't look sick. They look strong and healthy. Uh, but they're subject to enormous stress. Heat, cold, particularly the combat units, mines, snipers, complex attacks. They see their buddies uh, pulled apart. We got 80 veterans uh, treatment courts. It's working like magic. It's unbelievable. You put these people back together and tell them depend on each other and get the older veterans to reach out to them and get the compassion and the expertise of the judge 
uh, with American justice as it was supposed to work, where the prosecutor and the defense attorney both seek justice and more importantly from a policy outcome want to get these veterans back to their families and back to work. All of you in the audience, all of you in the audience who are involved in this effort are doing the Lord's work. God bless you. Thanks for your leadership on this issue.